Okay. Um, okay, great. Well, here we are, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, for another fantastic uh, seminar in our Human Evolution and Archaeological Sciences uh, series in the world of the Paleolithic. And today we're really thrilled to welcome Andrew Kandel from uh, Tübingen, the University of Tübingen. And uh, Andrew has a really fascinating uh, career. He um, started as, as an undergraduate back in the 1980s at, at the University of Rochester, New York, uh, where he was uh, studying geology. And then he moved into the world of oceanography. I know, so cool. Anyway, I won't go into all of the great details, but suffice it to say that he eventually turned towards the world of the Paleolithic, completing his doctoral dissertation at the University of Tübingen, where he's now based. He's a senior scientist currently and archaeologist at the Rocky uh, Project. This is this incredible role of culture in the early and expansions uh, expansion of, humans. of humans. It's a 20-year research project. How about that? 20 years funded. It's been going for 16 years. And you might have some of you seen um, this amazing publication of the database, the road database that came out recently, which contains this mag magnificent record of um, data, uh, information, archaeological sites, a whole range of things. So we're delighted to welcome Andrew today. He's going to give a talk about some of his work in Armenia. He's worked a lot in the Caucasus Mountains and in the Near East. And so we're really thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for coming. Hand you over now. We'll have some questions at the end. Anyone online can post some questions in the chat and uh, we'll have a, a nice, uh, a nice uh, series of questions at the end. So Andrew, welcome on over to you. Great. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Philip, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I work for the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. It's a complicated network with the university, with the Senckenberg Museum, and we have lots of collaboration partners as well. I've only listed some of the ones up here, for example, the University of Oslo, uh, as well as my Armenian colleagues. So the project began in 2009 when I met Boris Gasparian at the National Academy of Sciences in Armenia. And from there, we've... Um, done a field survey project, as well as excavations at Achitu 3. Um, in fact, although we surveyed for about 10 years, this was the only stratified site we could find. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is, uh, why it's so rare to find things in Armenia. So the focus of today's talk is going to be about plants, but I also decided that to just talk about the plants wasn't going to give you enough background information, and especially um, as an archaeologist now, uh, I want to know also what the people are doing, not just the plants, and how that relates uh, to the way that people used plants. So that's what the focus of today's talk is going to be. And uh, it's not changing. Uh, there we go. Okay. So the outline of the talk, I'm going to provide you with some geological background, some geomorphological background, a quick overview of research in Armenia, because I think that's important to put it in a, a context, the work that we've been doing there. Um, I'm going to talk about the Voratan Valley, which is a major tributary to the um, Kur and Arax's rivers that drain to the Caspian Sea. Uh, then I'll get into the results from Achitu 3, some of the um, cultural information that is important to understand the background and the setting for how people use plants at the site. And then finally, I'll wrap it up with uh, some summary and significance. So the area we're talking about is the Armenian volcanic highlands. You can see here, the sort of red circle um, encompasses more or less that area. As the name implies, it's high. Most of it's well above 1,000 meters. A lot of it's above 2,000 meters. So there's the question as well of adaptation to high elevations, uh, as well as climatic uh, inf uh, things that... Uh, 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 un un whoops. <laughs> uh, as cl climatic uh, changes and uh, the things that people did to adapt. Um, you can see it's between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, uh, and the region itself um, stretches through most of Armenia. It actually extends also into the Anatolian volcanic highlands. So it's not just an isolated region, but I'm focusing here on the Armenian part of it. So why would this be a good reason to exploit? First of all, there's extremely good sources of raw materials. Um, as you can uh, probably guess, in a volcanic region, there's lots of obsidian, but there's also other resources as well. Basalt is a major, uh, and dacite are both major raw materials that people use, so it was readily available. Um, the temperature, the, the, the climate is temperate, um, and there's a pronounced uh, seasonality. So the winters are actually relatively mild. 
uh, and the summers are also relatively mild. They're not like the Levant, where you expect temperatures in the 40s in the highlands. You really only have temperatures in the 30s. So it keeps things cooler and moister. Um, there's good uh, water reserves. There's lakes. There's rivers. There's snow um, on the mountains until June or July. So you have snow melt and really uh, rivers are running all the year. So you have good access to water. And because of this um, favorable conditions, there's also um, a lot of animals and plants that have adapted to the region. There's a very strong altitudinal gradient in the region. So you have a lot of different kinds of environment that you can reach just by going up and down so you don't have to go very far to change your environment and finally there's good possibilities for movement along the main tributaries uh, to the rivers uh, as well as along the main rivers themselves and there's a lot of high plateaus that are relatively easy to navigate across so our hypothesis in studying this area is to understand how people use resources and especially the uh, to see how they access varied resources um, to maximize maximize the yield from the environment during specific times of the year. Um, and I'll get more into those specifics as we progress through the test, uh, the talk. Um, so just what do we know so far about the middle and upper Paleolithic in Armenia? I'm not ignoring the lower Paleolithic. There's a very good record, but that's not the things that I'm really uh, focusing on. And what you can see here on this map, most of the sites are blue, middle Paleolithic. Uh, there's really only a handful of upper Paleolithic sites in red. And um, most of them are not deeply stratified and or not well dated. Um, one thing I can also say from this map, or you can see, is all of these obsidian sources, which pretty much dot the landscape. You don't have to go very far to find good, high quality raw material for napping. So that's really uh, one thing about this landscape that makes it very um, useful for people. So quick history of what's going on in Armenia right now. Uh, first, at the lower to middle Paleolithic transition, we have the site of Norgeri. Dan Adler and his team with Boris Kasparian is also excavating here. Um, and what they found was a site between around 300 and 400,000 years. Uh, it's sandwiched between two basalt flows with sediment in between. So it's a very unusual setting. And what you can hopefully see by this picture is the top basalt flow that's dated to around 200,000 actually. And then um, beneath that are the sediments. And finally, when you get below that, there's another layer of basalt. So it's a very difficult place to dig because you're digging in a very small area along a very long outcrop. And you can't under undermine the basalt too much because you could eventually uh, force it to collapse. But what's interesting about that site is that it actually shows us the beginnings of Mousterian technology while at the same time uh, showing Acheulean technology with it. And at first, everybody thought it was mixed, but the dating suggests that it's not mixed and that it's really a phenomenon that people were using the Acheulean technology, so making hand axes, as you see in number 16, but also uh, using level watt technology for making uh, blanks. Moving through the sequence in Armenia, there's another Middle Paleolithic site. Um, this one you might be familiar with here. Uh, Ron Panasi excavated it in the early 2000s and published it in 2008. Uh, it's about 104,000 plus or minus 10,000 years. And it's known for its elongated uh, blanks made using a uh, Levalwa technique. The late Middle Paleolithic is represented by Lusakert Cave in the Hrazdan River Gorge. Again, you see basalt uh, with small caves at the base of the basalt flow. Hopefully you can see that here in Lusakert 1 and Lusakert 2 as well. And while the dating on this site is a little bit unclear, it's mostly dating between 60 and 36,000. And the question here is, is it late Middle Paleolithic or is it early Upper Paleolithic? Most of the signs, uh, especially with the regards to level watt technology, suggest that it's Middle Paleolithic, um, but there's also a lot of Kambiwa technique used here. And there's some indication that this might be a late holdout for Neanderthals. I think there's a paper coming up soon. It's been talked about for a while um, where they're looking at uh, connecting some sites in Georgia to this site using tephro uh, chronology and tephro stratigraphy. And it could be very interesting if this is truly a, a late uh, Neanderthal uh, outpost in Armenia and the highlands. Uh, finally, another feature of the late Middle Paleolithic in Armenia is these truncated faceted points. Uh, they're known as the Yerevan type points, um, and they're basically small. Uh, 
uh, that are significant and prolific. The day estimated uh, site of Angehakot is a collapsed basalt cave. And you can see the remnants of it in the photograph here with Boris Gasparian walking around doing some survey with me. And finally, jumping through the, uh, the Upper Paleolithic into the very latest epi, uh, Upper Paleolithic, the, what, what the authors call Epi Gervedian. Um, Cyril Montoya and his team uh, discovered this on the banks of a small river, very well dated between 16 and 18,000 with one or two occupations uh, along the banks of the river. Uh, and they have a clearly Upper Paleolithic assemblage. It's highly laminar uh, with backed uh, and shouldered pieces. So this gives you a brief overview of what Armenia looks like, what we know about it. And uh, what I'm going to tell you now is how we can fill in the part between the end of the Middle Paleolithic and what I just showed you from um, this site here at Kalavan. So Sunik is the province where Akitu is found. It's in southern Armenia. Uh, it's a narrow uh, tongue of Armenia that stretches down to Iran and is surrounded by Azerbaijan. Uh, and it's really a dynamic landscape. And for the last million and a half years, or probably two million years, it's been subject to faulting and uplift. Um, there's been eruptive volcanism. I've showed you a lot of the uh, examples of the sites you saw before with basalt flows and basalt um, deposits. Uh, so lava gets deposited, there's ash falls. It's, it's a highly volatile region in many ways. Um, there's, when the volcanoes erupt, the lava flows down the mountains and blocks the main drainage, the Voratan, which drains to the southeast towards the Caspian Sea. And this forms lakes behind it and the lakes are then places that sediment form. And the lakes would have also been good places for Paleolithic people to live. And my first idea with this project was to follow, uh, using uh, GIS, is to follow the old lake shores and to look for settlement along those lakes. That was at around 1,800 meters, and we just didn't find anything. There were not really good exposures. The places we could access the materials, we couldn't get to. Um, and so uh, in the end, because I found Akitu, I moved there, and instead of focusing on earlier deposits, I actually ended up fo focusing on later deposits. Um, but as these lakes formed, um, there, there were the diatomites that were deposited in them. There was a record uh, in one place that stated between 1.4 and 0 0.7 million years, um, and there's incredible fossils of plants in there. Uh, I mentioned that because of the theme of the, the talk, but unfortunately there's no bone preservation and there's no evidence that people were there during that times. In other places in Armenia, we do have that, but in Sunik, I never found that with 10 years of survey, which I thought was unfortunate. On the other hand, I was happy that Akitu existed. And then finally, uh, the lakes would eventually erode through the basalt and the river would flow again, and there would be erosion that was uh, happening. In addition to that, there's also glaciation that's going on. So it's a really dynamic landscape. Seasonality is an important aspect of it because of the altitudinal gradient that I mentioned. Um, and so basically, um, for this study, you, looking at the Upper Paleolithic, we assume that people adapted to changing environmental conditions over many time scales. So Akitu three. Here's what it looks like. It's called a blister cave. Uh, Chris Miller describes it as such. It's a basalt flow that actually was in place between 120 and 110,000 years ago. Uh, it flowed down the mountain. It blocked the Voratan. It made a lake behind it. Eventually, the lake cut through, and the river continued on its course. Um, it's at 1,600 meters, and we've been excavating there since 2009 until 2017. There was a long break, and we commenced uh, excavation again in 2022, and we plan to continue digging there in the future. And what we found were 12 geological layers all the way down to bedrock. Uh, there's a sequence of over five meters, and we encountered five upper Paleolithic horizons with evidence of human occupation. And the dates are between 24 and 39,000. So we basically got five meters of sequence in 15,000 years. So it's a very fast deposition. A lot of it is due to rock falls. Um, but in any case, we have a very good ability to really look at the sequence on a very fine scale. So the excavation in the green is the Paleolithic aspects inside the cave and underneath the overhang. And you can see uh, the extent of it here where we dug in 2022 and also the deep sounding, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment. In addition, um, because we don't just focus on 
the Upper Paleolithic, we can't ignore the fact that there's classical remains uh, all the way in front of the cave, and you can see the blue area extending basically ad infinitum. Um, it's not surprising. This place was used during the Bronze Age, during the Iron Age, um, during the medieval periods, and we have evidence through pottery of that continued use. So it really has an extremely long history of occupation, and we didn't ignore it, and I'll, you'll see in some of the pictures how it looks. So in 2009, we began. There was a small test trench dug by a French team, but they placed it in such a way that they didn't find any finds. Uh, we came back because we found some things in the profiles. And by 2011, we had established that there was a very good occupation. Uh, 2013, we extended the deep pit, which you can see is really deep. Um, it's not my favorite place to be now, especially because everything's gotten a little loose and we've stopped working there until we can stabilize the excavation. By 2017, you see in the lower uh, right, we've extended the excavation in front of the cave. And actually now we've reached all the way to the edge of the terrace. So the whole thing is excavated and it's just one feature after the next, stone structures, walls, uh, and burials, 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 as far as you can see. And here's one example of a seven person burial um, with uh, three coins in the mouths. Hopefully you can see the little green object there. That's one of the coins before it was uh, restored. And these are the coins afterwards. Uh, and they date to the first century uh, BCE. Carbon uh, 14 dates confirm that as well. So that was an interesting find, but it's totally in the way, to be honest. It's right above the deep pit. And it, these loose rocks that make the grave of the tomb are very unstable. So it really precludes us from digging too much deeper for now. In addition, as we got to the edge of the terrace in 2019, uh, in this new pit, which is underneath the level, you can see these walls here, these structures that are a major feature of the classical uh, use of the site. There's a pit when we excavated in 2022, we, we recovered 47 crania, very few postcranial uh, pieces, but some, and no pottery, no very little fauna. Uh, and it states uh, to the second to fourth century uh, BCE. So it's interesting, but again, it's all in the way. And all I want to do is get to deeper layers where I can look at the Paleolithic, but we have to deal with it. And so that's life. And I think it's interesting enough that there's a lot of studies going on with it. Um, I'm not going to focus on those things now. I'm going to get to what we really want to talk about, which is the deep sounding and the main occupations of Achitu. Here you can just see the accumulations of sediment. They've been divided into five archaeological horizons, which you know the AHs of uh, three to seven. And uh, basically, you can see a thin deposit up here, an almost sterile layer of this large packet of um, rocks in AH4 with sediment in between. You can really see a lot of these huge rocks comprising these giant rock falls that we had to remove. And then finally, underneath it uh, is layer five. It starts to become finer grained. And we see a few indications of people being there at the site. And by layer six, we have uh, very fine sediment that's really great to dig uh, with low density of occupation. And finally, layer seven, uh, also with a very low density of occupation. And just an interesting note, this 12th geological layer is actually the underground it's the existing landscape before the lava was emplaced, so before 120,000 years. And it's a purple sediment that's volcanoclastic. It's very unusual. And what it is, is it's literally the horizon that was cooked as the lava flowed across the sediment. And we have that in many places in the landscape. So these are things that, you know, when you're used to limestone caves or sandstone caves, you don't think about these things. But in fact, it's really interesting. And it's things that you never really thought to look for. So, but it's a very clear understanding of the former paleo landscape, how it looked before the lava was emplaced. The chronology is very secure. Um, you can see here how it dates. I'm not going to read it out, but we have 37 dates. Um, these are calibrated, and you can see, and these are just listed by layer and then by depth. I haven't even done anything to, to modify them, and it, it's really very coherent. It's on both charcoal and bone. And now moving to some of the finds, just to give you an overview. I mentioned, of course, the obsidian. It's about 85% of the raw material of the lithics. They're the main category of finds we have. 
Um, in addition, there's a lot of chert, about 15%, with a very, very small amount of basalt and dacite, which is used uh, really rarely at the site. As you can see by the cores on the right, um, they're highly reduced. They're very small. They're all between two and three centimeters for the most part. Um, and they're aimed at making bladelets on unidirectional cores. Even when, when, when a core gets uh, used, people try to rotate it and make a new platform and use it always unidirectionally. There's no true bidirectional or multidirectional. It's just a process of making it. And the main goal was to make bladelets, as you can see here, and they were very successful at it. It's really a huge part of the assemblage. The obsidian is beautiful to look at. Um, and the chert, interestingly enough, is really manufactured in a very similar way. There's hardly any differences in the way that people reduced the artifacts. Uh, a quick look at the tools. So we divided them into armature tools, part of a hunting kit, and domestic tools. In general, the um, blades, the bladelets uh, were used to create backed pieces, or in many cases, just laterally, re laterally retouched pieces. Um, and this ratio of bladelets that are retouched laterally to back blades increases through time. So at the beginning of the sequence, we have very few back pieces. And by the end of the sequence, backing is very predominant. And that seems to be a trend that uh, we can correlate with trends in Georgian sites, at Serbia, for example, and Zwana. Uh, as well as there's another site that uh, one of my colleagues in Connecticut is digging, uh, Tanner Kovach, or a site called Solak. And so we have an interesting way to look at the chronology through time and see this change in behavior. Uh, the domestic tools are uh, scrapers, denticulates, you can see the list here. Um, they're generally larger pieces, uh, whereas the armature tools were very likely hafted, the domestic tools did not need to be hafted. They were at least large enough that they could be used on their own. So where does the basalt come from? It's a really interesting question, and it gives me a chance to show you some of the beautiful landscape. So this is a volcano called Bazenk, and this outcrop you see, it's about up to through almost 3,000 meters. You can see at the base here, um, we huge pieces of obsidian, 60 centimeters, is just lying there. And it looks like it's even been napped by somebody in the past. Um, and these are just lying around on the surface, surrounded by many, many smaller pieces. This outcrop is about 20 meters high. So you can look at this. There's no scale, unfortunately, because it's impossible to place a scale here. We didn't have somebody walk there, unfortunately. But it's really a large feature on the landscape, but it's a pinpoint feature. And it's something that you can identify uh, based on its chemical signature to its provenience. So another way that people could collect uh, obsidian, not just going to the primary sources, but also the secondary sources, almost all of the tributaries and river valleys are littered with obsidian. So it's it's very easy to find it. It's really not difficult. And here's my colleague Boris again, Boris Gasparian, uh, as we were on field survey, just looking for some of the places where the material would come from. And we worked with Ellery Fram in Yale University, who did a PRX uh, F analysis of where the material comes from. And in the lower layers, layers six and seven, so that's about 39 to 32,000, we have mostly 99% regional obsidian coming from the sources that you see here that I just showed you. But there's still some evidence of long distance transport. About 1% of the pieces come from quite far away. What's interesting is how that changes when we move to layer three. So the regional Obsidian is still predominant, but it drops and we have 8% exotic. And it's really coming from all different directions, including even from um, the Eastern Anatolian highlands. So this is a really interesting way for us to see where people were going, where people were getting their materials, whether they were exchanging it, um, and seeing that people really had an influence across all of the Armenian highlands. Oops, wrong way. So what does the fauna look like? Um, for those that are interested in it, it's basically a focus on medium and large ungulates, mainly over caprins and equids. One change you see here is in the lower layers, it's predominantly ovis and capra, whereas in the upper layer three, it's more evenly split between equids and ovis. So um, this suggests to us, uh, the fauna suggests to uh, Alex Bertaki actually, who did the analysis, um, short and repeated seasonal occupations. He sees selective transport of these medium-sized carcasses. Um, and 
assumes that it's indicating larger territories that people were covering. Um, the reason he thinks that is because the Equids generally would have preferred open landscape and the Caprins and Ovids would have normally preferred rocky or uh, wooded landscape. And so he sees, especially in layer three, two different places where people are getting their, their meals. Um, there's also accumulations by raptors and carnivores. There's abundant birds and microfauna, as well as fish, uh, reptiles, and amphibians. Uh, in the record. So it's really a diverse faunal assemblage. Some pre preliminary results delivered by uh, Vivian Sloan just this week um, using a new technique by uh, her uh, student, Szymanski, um, give us an idea of the fact that, first of all, 18 of 23 samples uh, resulted in mitochondrial DNA. The ungulates you probably have noticed that they were all present in the faunal remains as well as the canids. But interestingly enough, we have no felid or hyenid, hyenid or ursid remains, and they were uh, suggested by the mitochondrial DNA. So it's a nice way to expand what we know from the faunal assemblages by using uh, this technique in the sediment. Um, also, rodents are present, which is not surprising. They use the site as well, and they're uh, represented in the um, ancient DNA that we have present. In addition, there was one case of human DNA uh, at the age of 28,000. It's not surprising that it's uh, associated with anatomically modern humans. There's no indication of Neanderthal or Denisovan in the sequence for this um, person. And uh, this is the, actually the first that I found out about this was just two days ago. So I was really excited to hear that. In a sense, because we're dealing with the Upper Paleolithic, we don't debate about who made it. But it's still nice to know that there's evidence that modern humans were responsible for the assemblage, which is what we would have, would have and have assumed. There's incredibly good preservation of the fauna. Uh, here on the upper left, you see a candid skull that's complete with the mandibles as well. It's in a black layer, sublayer that's uh, caused by volcanic ash. Uh, in addition, here you can sort of see the fine situation. I hope you can recognize here the uh, mandible of the horse. Uh, here's an obsidian blade. Uh, and then here, there's actually a shaft fragment that's been broken in a fresh straight, a state and has cut marks on it, as well as charcoal. And that was typical of the layer three, especially. Uh, in addition, you can see like the really exceptional preservation of these other elements here from layer six. And one thing that was really nice because of this skull, we were questioning, were these wolves or dogs? Because that's a big topic. Um, Verena Schunemann uh, and her team looked at this. Uh, Sirwan Ali did a, mass, uh, a bachelor's uh, study on it. He scanned the skull. He compared it with measurements to wolves and dogs, and he found that it was cons consistent with wolf. The genetic position was that it's a basal canid position. You can see here the red, the Akitu canids. Here are the Paleolithic dogs uh, from sites in, um, in Western Europe, uh, most notably um, from Belgium and the Czech Republic. And then here's the domesticated dogs into four groups called A, B, C, and D. Um, and there's no relationship between these dogs, uh, the dog, the canids at Akitu and other things that people call dogs. Um, the isotope studies of the elements suggested we have an arid environment, which is not surprising, with a relatively high level of sulfur. And uh, the find, just to uh, repeat, was in layer five, uh, dated to around 31,000. Uh, in addition, there's organic artifacts only in layer three. In layer six and seven, we don't have any yet. Um, there are uh, awls here. You can see this beautiful bone point, uh, as well as an eyed bone needle. Uh, which is unusual because it's one of the oldest ones that exists that's in a securely dated context. Um, there's probably eight or nine that come from reasonably well-dated contexts all in Asia, and it suggests that the origin of sewing or probably clothing manufacturing is in Asia, but really they're spread out throughout. They're coming from the Caucasus, they're coming from East Asia, as well as from Northern Siberia. Uh, the, the, the needles that we have between 30 and 40,000. Uh, in addition, there's shell beads uh, that are perforated. Uh, some of them have ochre uh, stains on them. Uh, so just another interesting thing, the beads are probably coming from brackish environments. We first hypothesized they were coming from the Caspian Basin, but we were informed that they could possibly come from other brackish places along the Voratan, in which case they don't indicate a very 
uh, strong uh, transport distance, but rather a local origin. But still, there are more evidence for people sewing, for people uh, adorning themselves, as well as wearing um, garments. And there's really um, numerous combustion features. Again, a, a difference between layer three and the layer six is that in layer three, there are composite features, probably the results of raking and cleaning and maintenance of hearths. But some of them are actually stacked hearths where you have multiple um, indications. You can see some of the charcoal and the ashes here. Whereas in layer six, they're isolated. They're single occupations. You can really see these beautiful uh, remnants. It looks like Austria, I would say, probably the sediment. It's very lusic. Um, and uh, there's the, the rubified sediment be beneath it. I hope you can see that. There's a charcoal layer and then ash on top of it. So they're probably intact uh, single-use hearths, so single occupations. And this is another example of that, actually, where there's two hearths, one somewhat below and one somewhat above. Uh, not as uh, pristine as the one in the left. Uh, some of the environmental information I think is really important just to put it into a better and bigger context. Um, Lior Weisbrot, um, who's now with the Israeli Antiquity Authority and was usually, uh, formerly in Haifa, uh, used the microfaunas to, uh, fauna to determine the the nature of the climate. Uh, in the lower layers here in red, uh, he has hamsters, which suggests it was warmer. And then in the upper layers, he has more presence of the pica, which suggests that it was colder, whereas the voles um, are present throughout, but they're not really strongly indicative of the climate. But he views this as evidence that the earlier periods were warmer, the later periods were colder as we get closer to the LGM. Uh, also, Dorothy Drucker in Tübingen looked at some of the isotopes. She looked at carbon, nitrogen, also sulfur, which I don't present here. And what you can see is, interestingly enough, a very clear differentiation between the layers. So layer six in green and layer three in blue are completely separated from each other, suggesting that there is a climatic effect. Um, she attributes it to aridity as well as temperature changes, uh, which is supporting what Lior said from the microfauna, whereas layer seven seems to be sort of in the middle, sort of an intermediate stage. Also, um, Alex Brittingham at the University of Connecticut now in Jerusalem, and actually back in Connecticut now, um, looked at the plant waxes. Uh, he looked at the sediments throughout the sequence. Um, here you can see just incredible fluctuations. He sees the warmer phases, the upper parts, and cooler phases, the lower parts. But in general, I think the earlier phases have more warming episodes with very strong differentiation, which he suggests may be related to stadial interstadial uh, variability. Um, and the magnitude is actually even greater than that seen in the Black Sea surface temperatures, um, where there's a very good record. Um, and I mentioned also volcanic ash. Ash falls were common. This just gives you an idea of how frequently they occur. They're so large, I mean, you can see the level here, 250,000 shards per gram, that basically these layers are completely made of volcanic ash. But even the layers that don't have so much are still about 50,000. I heard a talk on Friday last week in Tübingen about the Toba eruption in a site in India on the West Coast. They have two shards. And they're basing the two shards and say that because of the date, it has to be Toba. Here, we're just overwhelmed with it. We're trying, I'm working with um, uh, Simon Holdaway in um, UCL and with Reese Timms, uh, who has left the field, unfortunately, um, to try to un uh, disentangle this. Because if we can determine which eruptions these are, we might be able to correlate the site with other sites and then have a better understanding of the regional uh, tephro uh, chronology and stratigraphy. And finally, to the plants, which is um, what was supposed to be the top billing, but I thought that the background I gave you was really important for you to understand the nature of what's going on here, both um, in terms of human occupation and in terms of the environment. The plants sort of straddle both of those fields. Um, the sedimentary DNA that we uh, I will talk about in a moment um, is a proxy both for human activity at the site as well as for environment. The pollen is more environmental, mostly windborne. Uh, charcoal is clearly a result of people at the site uh, and keeping fires and burning uh, wood. We also have non-pollen polynomorphs. You can see examples here of what that is. Um, and especially there's a lot of algae in the lower layers 
which um, Angela Bruch, who's working on that, suggests is related to humidity in the vicinity of the site. So sort of torf-like layers, there's lots of algae in it, and what the geomorphologist has recommended or suggested is that he sees a place where either a dammed river is creating a swamp-like environment or just along the edges of a meandering river that drained through the area by Ahitu was responsible for this uh, moisture. So that's going to be another theme we're going to talk about a little bit is differentiation between aridity and climatic variation versus local variation of humidity and how that can affect what we see. Uh, in addition, um, Johan Jarl in Connecticut is working on the phytoliths, uh, and there's even one remain of wood, a uh, piece of bast. So uh, there's really exceptional preservation here, and there's really a lot of examples of how people used plants. Um, this is uh, Annika Terskura from Oslo, who just completed her PhD last year, uh, sampling uh, layer three at Ahitu, just to show you the techniques she used. Um, these layers are reachable. These are the deeper layers in layer six and seven. And um, you can see multiple lines of soil sampling, some of them for the DNA, some of them for the tephra, uh, and some of them for pollen as well. So we've really done a lot of sampling here because the sediment in the deeper part is very conducive to sampling soil and to analyzing it. Um, so what did she find uh, in the analysis? First of all, of the 25 samples she ran, 22, so a very high number, had evidence of having plants. And she identified 43 taxa, uh, which is, I, I think, pretty impressive. Um, in terms of the numbers that she did. And she saw fluctuation in the layers. In the deeper layers, she actually had a lot of uh, DNA abundance. In layers four and five, where human occupation is almost down to zero, she saw very little. And then in layer three again, which is colder, she also sees an increase in the DNA abundance. Um, she viewed that as tracking the overall climatic trends and correlating with the human operation occupation, which uh, hints at the relationship between plants and humans. So this was one proxy we had, which was uh, quite innovative. We combined it with the pollen analysis, which was one of the few um, materials at Akitu that doesn't have great concentrations, but still there was enough to come up with some theses. Uh, in general, um, you can see there's really only one sample that has a lot of uh, pollen in it and a few in layer three, but in the upper layers with this dark green, you have mixed boil uh, forests with small components of other environments, whereas in the lower layers, you see the predominance of yellow, you have a mixed stepic environment. And that tracks well with aridity uh, and then more moisture. And you can also add into that what we know about the microfauna, that it's um, warmer below and cooler uh, above. And so this, again, tracks the overall climatic trends that we see throughout the site. Another proxy was charcoal. Um, and here, it's very interesting because this is only chosen by people, of course. Uh, charcoal, uh, it's mostly woody in nature. People choose bigger uh, branches and bigger trees to work with. And you can see one species, the sea buckthorn, uh, as predominant here. It's in most of the layers, over 50%. Really, the only exception is in layer three, where we have more willow. And so you see this trend uh, in the sea buckthorn. You also see in the lower layers um, the increased niter bush. And she suggests, uh, uh, sorry, Ethel Alloway in Tarragona is working on the charcoal. And she suggests um, that this is indicated of an arid environment, whereas in layer three, where she sees more river species um, and also more variety of forest and open forest species, um, she sees uh, a more mixed environment uh, that's also um, moist or more humid. And this is how Ethel interprets the landscape. So in layer seven at the base of the sequence, we have a more arid and open environment uh, based on the charcoal alone, I should say. Um, but it does match with the other records. Um, by around the end of layer six, we have a more mixed environment. And finally, in the youngest horizon, we see um, a more humid environment with much more uh, diversity. 
And what we did is we worked with Angela Buch uh, as well as with Annika Tuskur um, to come up with ideas about how people were using plants. We can't really say for sure how people were using some of these species, but we can say what possibility people would have had to use these plants. So it's about the the, the, the usability f of these resources for early humans. Um, and we can um, understand sort of how they relate to climate and environment, also to cultural developments. And then we use the Plant Bites database to examine the potential for human use. And this database that she's been developing with many of her colleagues uh, is aimed at trying to understand these questions. Um, it allows her to analyze any of the plant parts to understand how they were useful to people in different categories that she determined, for example, food, utility, thatching, weaving, but also medicinal uses um, or insect repellent, uh, as well as flavorings. So things that couldn't be used as bulk food um, might be useful as flavorings um, to um, also because they're, because they're edible. So, and one component of this is also using natural modern vegetation units to try to infer from the past. So the plant space, uh, the plant bites database is something that she's been developing um, with her colleagues, and we hope that it'll get more use in the future. This is one of the offshoots of the, the Rocky Project, um, trying to understand the whole picture uh, of human evolution. And at Ahitu, um, what we looked at was the genera, uh, species, um, taxa that were only defined to genera and species. So we excluded things that were just general. But even then, we had 43, as I mentioned before. And what these charts show you is, is that there's actually an incredible separation between the red or the rust colored that were identified by sedimentary DNA, by the green in pollen. And the overlap is only in yellow here. You can see in all of these little circle charts, the overlap is really, really minimal. And you can also see that most of the things identified were um, herbal materials that were inferred to be useful as medicine, but many of them were also possibly used for bulk foods and flavoring or dyes, insect repellents, and other uses as well, which includes thatching, kindling, um, resin, uh, things like that. So that was a really interesting um, result, is that in fact, what this is, and we didn't do it with charcoal, um, and I'll show you why we didn't do that in a moment, what was really fascinating was is that these two records are giving us really different but very complementary views. Right? I think that's the main thing we, we gained from this, is how important it is to do multi-proxy analyses when you can. And so if you compare them, um, woody versus herbaceous was just an easy way to do it. You can see for the sedimentary DNA, almost everything was herbaceous. For the pollen, it was more mixed, but still focused on herbaceous. Charcoal, not surprisingly, is more woody. And I just include the macro remains here because that was also woody. Um, and it was a species that matched well with the other records. Um, so you see here is that each proxy provides a different view for reconstructing past vegetation. Um, the charcoal and the macro remains are very likely selected by people. The sedimentary DNA was affected by people, but there was also a contribution from animals in the environment, so a natural component, whereas the pollen relates almost exclusively to the environment. And the big surprise was the overlap of identified uh, taxa is extremely low. And here's just some examples. Um, I'm getting ready to wrap up it now soon. Um, some examples of potential uses, the hippophay raminoides, which is the sea buckthorn. That was the one that was very predominant uh, for the charcoal use, but also present in the other records. Through the plant bites database, we can see that these um, the fruits are edible, um, that they're rich in vitamins A and C. Um, they're less acidic after cooking or frost. I don't know if you've ever dr had this drink before, um, but it's, it's really delicious, and it's often commonly used here uh, in Europe uh, in ice cream. I don't know if you've had that before. Um, Sand Duan, is the, the, and it's a beautiful orange color as well, which brings us to the fact that the, um, the leaves and the fruits can be used as a dye. Oil from the seeds is uh, used in cosmetics, and of course, wood could be used for construction, but obviously we know it was also used as fuel 
uh, as charcoal. And the macro remain happens to have been the species as well. So we really have a, a round picture of, of this particular use. Another interesting story is told by Isatis tinctoria. It's known as Dyer's Woad, uh, and its leaves create a blue dye. And it's interesting, you might know in uh, Dzudzuana, there was a publication about 30,000 uh, dated that suggests that there were flax fibers that were dyed blue in the sediment. Not everybody believes that this is robust data. I'm skeptical, but it's reported, and it was at least the samples were taken in, in good conditions. So I don't think that there's any reason to doubt it. Um, so if we combine that information with the fact that there were four kinds of plants that were useful to make thread, this sort of goes back to the story I started to tell you before about clothing and sewing and personal adornment, that this fits in well together into one sort of aspect of human behavior. So to summarize, um, there's several phases of settlement, uh, ranging from 39 to 24,000. Uh, the intensity changes tremendously from the base of the sequence up through the sequence with uh, significant changes in climate. In general, I divide it into just the lower part and the upper part. The lower part seems to be warmer and more arid. Uh, we have sparse settlement. I showed you evidence of just single occupation burning events. We have relatively few artifacts. Um, people seem to be very mobile. Um, but in the upper layer, layer three, we have increases in technology. We see more backing increasing through that sequence. We see the um, input of organic tools and shell beads, the suggestion of uh, manufacture of clothing. We see complex combustion features, uh, which are telling us that people were at the site for longer periods. Um, in the end, we still see the whole site as a seasonal camp. We don't think that it was occupied at least during the winter, um, but we're still looking into that uh, for now. Um, the reason is, that at least in modern times, it's rather cold um, and it's snowy. And so because of the altitudinal gradient, it's really easy for people to get to lower elevations. You only have to go about 20 or 30 kilometers, and you can be in a much more comfortable place, which isn't covered with snow. So. It's sort of based on a modern argument, but I think it's it's also logical based on the evidence we have so far that this is really temporary camps using the, um, the Armenian volcanic highlands as an important resource in the rounds of uh, upper Paleolithic people. And with that, I'd like to say Shmoro Kalutsun, which of course is thank you in Armenian, and I thank uh, various uh, institutes that have been supporting this research, and especially my collaborators, uh, without whom I couldn't have presented these data. So thank you.